It's a strange world that we live in, and the future isn't what it used to be. We've always had such an infinite capacity for creation and compassion and joy, but also for rage and cruelty. You see, I think your life and everything is a non-linear system. We understand linear systems, cause and effect, positive correlation and negative correlation. The problem with a non-linear system is that the interactions quickly become too complex. No one remains one person. And what if a conversation could change the way that you think about yourself and the world? And what if everything that you held to be true was somehow, in some way, wrong? I'm Dr. Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. Professor Peter Doherty, uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, uh, You shared the 1996 Nobel Prize for Medicine with your colleague Ralph uh, Zinkenagel um, for discoveries about transplantation and killer T-cell mediated immunity, um, which, and the understanding of this has led to um, uh, developing treatments for uh, cancer. Uh, you were the first veterinarian to win the Nobel Prize. Um, I was just interested in some of your work in relation to understanding the complexities of CD8 plus T-cell mediated immunity in memory, uh, and how this can be or how this can inform developing vaccines for pandemics like COVID-19. Yeah, this is um, what, what uh, my research career has been about in the immunology sense. So I've done um, some other, a lot of other things. There's um, these uh, what are called the killer T cells. Yes. These are a class of white blood cells that go around the body and the blood. And uh, when we get uh, exposed to to a stimulus, Uh, they respond very, very specifically to that stimulus and multiply and multiply and multiply and and do the job of bumping off cells that are dangerous. So they can bump off virus infected cells, which is really important because the way viruses grow is to get into our cells and use our cells as factories. Mm. So part of the recovery process from a virus infection is to kill those factories. And that's what the killer T cells do. But they're also, they also play a part in keeping cancer in control. And, uh, and we've known for years, in fact, that these cells are often sitting in tumors and doing nothing. And uh, a, a friend of mine called Jim Allison worked out uh, that you could wake them up again so they worked and could bump off the tumor. And that's the Nobel Prize from a couple of years back, uh, or a year or so back to Allison and Honjo where they worked out how to turn those killer cells back on and get rid of cancers like melanoma. Mm. So that's been the main clinical result, but, um, but otherwise uh, uh, consciousness of what we did is, uh, and what we did actually conceptually in terms of thinking about the immune system was change the whole thinking about what we call the cell mediated side opposite from the antibody side, which is the main part when it comes to vaccine protection. I read a review article uh, that you're a co-author on, uh, which looked at, uh, at the understanding that we've gleaned or gleaned from um, the Spanish influenza of 1918. Um, and you said recently, I think, in the Australian that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, we should say the Spanish influenza, uh, killed approximately 50 million people. And it was one of the most, uh, I suppose, fatal uh, events that the human race has uh, seen in, in, in human history. Um, but you said that SARS-CoV-2 was uh, equally infectious and, and fatal. Um, as a counterpoint to yeah. that, I, um, I note a recent interview with uh, Professor uh, Michael Levitt, who's also a Nobel laureate uh, at Stanford University, who uh, has said that the lockdowns uh, in countries like Australia were a mistake, and that, um, in fact, he didn't feel that the disease was as 
deadly, well, certainly deadly to older people, a certain older demographic, but um, that the economic detriment would be greater than the disease itself. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. Uh, yes, yes. Firstly, the statement that, um, that COVID-19 is as bad as the Spanish flu, I, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding between me and the journalists there. I might have said it's spreading like Spanish flu, but I've never thought it's as bad as Spanish flu. And the reason for that is Spanish flu killed a lot of fit young adults. Mm. This one doesn't. It kills some, but not many. So I don't think it's as bad as the Spanish flu. Mm. We won't know what the eventual death totals are or what the long-term health consequences are for those who get infected and recovered for some considerable time. We really, you know, it's just got to work its way through. I'd always been a bit embarrassed by the fact that we said, um, you know, 40 to 100 million people died of the Spanish flu and the fact we haven't had a better figure, but I'm wondering mm. whether we'll get a bigger, better figure out of COVID-19. I mean, some jurisdictions are actually trying to suppress the numbers, including yeah, some it, American states, which is very It uh, seems as though you support the, the idea of the lockdowns as a, as a really good pragmatic way of limiting spread and social distancing. Um, and that was uh, at odds with someone like Professor Michael Levitt. It should be noted though that Michael Levitt is not a epidemiologist. Well, I'm not an epidemiologist either, but I have been a bit involved in this area for years. But, but Michael Levitt said that early on. I'm not sure he's still saying it. They've had 70,000 deaths in the United States. And I'll be, I think they'll be lucky to finish with less than a quarter of a million to half a million. So he might have changed his mind somewhere along the line. Uh, but it was always a legitimate argument to say, OK, uh, this is mainly killing old people and people who aren't very fit. Mm. And so if you're a real uh, strict Darwinian, you might say, well, you know, let him go. Mm. And uh, that, that, that's an argument. The British tried to protect the old people at the beginning mm. and uh, tried to lock them away. That worked very badly. And uh, they've had a lot of infection. Proportionally, they've had more deaths than the United States, but it really uh, got going a bit faster there than in the US at a big level. So it's, it's always been a legitimate argument. And personally, as an older person, I'm grateful to the Australian government and to, uh, to the Australian people uh, for going along with the lockdown. Because what that did is it allowed us to put in place a lot more testing capacity so we can track down uh, if we get spot fires after we relax, um, relax the uh, uh, guidelines, as we are doing. And it will also also allow us to get much more hospital equipment and beds and trained personnel in place. So, so if someone gets this disease now, we hopefully won't get into the position that Northern Italy got into, mm. that people over 65 were simply triaged as far as ventilators was concerned and, uh, and essentially left to die without help. Mm. I believe historically as well that countries that when pandemics had broken out, I think 1957, 1968, um, obviously 2009, um, that the countries that locked down early actually recovered more quickly economically as well. So, um, But compared with this, these were minor events. I mean, mm. this is a major event, which in economic terms is certainly in many ways comparable to 1918. And, uh, and it was true in 1918, actually, that the American jurisdictions, which locked down more effectively, did a lot better. Uh, Philadelphia, for instance, where I lived for a number of years, didn't and had very high death rates. Mm -hmm. And so locking down uh, does work. I mean, we've seen that it works, but we can't stay locked down forever for obvious reasons. And, uh, and I think uh, what's being done now is, uh, is basically what's rational. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, we don't know how it will go. We're all hoping we can keep this as kind of spot fires that we just damp down. If that works, I think we'll be in good shape. Uh, it may be we're better off than we think we are and uh, we won't see a lot of flare ups. But my suspicion is once people start crowding together again, particularly in pubs and bars and nightclubs and places where you kind of drop your guard. Um, we'll see, we'll see flare-ups. Uh, but we want to keep them under control. And I think uh, uh, the Treasurer is just being saying that, I think, this afternoon. 
Well, it runs uh, counter. I see Professor Levitt's original idea was just, uh, he doesn't use the term, but somewhere around uh, herd immunity. But if you look at the crit critical factor rates, even the most conservative ones, I mean, they've changed over time, but I think 1.4%. Uh, you know, if you're looking at 60% of people infected, you, 20 to 60% of people infected to get something that sounds like herd immunity, uh, then you're looking at 50 to 150,000 deaths in somewhere like Australia. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, mm. that would be the case if it just ran rampant. Uh, the, the, um, the death rates will be up to the time we get a decent vaccine. I, mean, I have no real doubt that we can get a decent vaccine, but I think... Australia wouldn't see that before the first quarter of 2021 under even the most optimistic predictions. Some other countries might, uh, but we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, we don't know, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, but there will be, there is, uh, there's a British vaccine that's already gone into about, I think, five or 600 people in the UK. Right. And basically half of them have got the vaccine, half haven't. They've been put out there in the community where the, the virus is still uh, transmitting and we'll see whether they're protected or not and whether they're safe if they are protected. So it's basically that's how it has to be tested. And once you've once you've tested a vaccine through um, um, animals, which is basically uh, some form of animal like a ferret or a hamster or or some genetically manipulated mouse strain, uh, you then have to test it in monkeys, uh, macaques or African greens in this case. And if that looks safe at that stage and it looks to be effective, then you have to put it into people and you just have to put them out there where the virus is because, you know, you can't challenge them with virus. So it's, um, there's a risk in it and there's a risk in it for the people who take the vaccine. There's also the possibility they'll be protected early, which would be nice for them. Oh, I note the work of um, Professor Ian Fraser uh, from Queensland University, uh, who was one of the uh, developers of the H. Uh, PV vaccine, uh, and he was talking about the difficulty for uh, developing uh, vaccines for things like SARS-CoV-2, um, that it affected the upper respiratory tract. And, and I think uh, the quote from him was that it would be the equivalent of, of developing a vaccine for the uh, bacteria on your skin. And I wondered what your thoughts, because you sound as though, uh, from no, what I've heard we, of you, um... Yeah, I know what Ian, where Ian's coming from, but, um, but basically we make, um, uh, they're not great in the elderly and they're not perfect. We make pretty reasonable flu vaccines and um, they protect a lot of people and give a good measure of protection. So no, I think we can make a vaccine against this. Um, part of the thing, of course, is this isn't a virus that like HIV or something like that persists or like Ian's papillomavirus for that matter, uh, that he, he developed his vaccine against. So um, basically, even a vaccine that was partially protective, limited transmission by uh, decreasing virus load and, and caused people not to get seriously ill would be fine. So there's uh, various ways this could work. I, th I think on the whole, that we're probably going to get a pretty good vaccine. Whether it gives sterilizing immunities, I, I'd be a bit doubtful, but I would think that um, it will be fine and we may need to boost it. We may, if the virus sticks around, people might need an annual shot or something. And if the virus changes, it hasn't yet in any significant way. If the virus changes, we may need to tweak it a bit. I, I'm not, I'm fairly confident we'll get a decent vaccine though. Uh, well, I, I, I know that there's been a paper released uh, talking about the, the, the uh, predominant variant now in China and Europe and, and here is the G stri uh, strain, which is uh, different from the original um, uh, D strain. Um, and that this surprised the researchers because they felt as though, I mean, coronavirus is, uh, has a low mutational uh, change. It's fairly stable and they were surprised to see a mutation so early on. So I was wondering what you uh, what you thought about that and also the researchers claim about that the G strain has become sort of evolved and become more predominant because it is more infectious. Yes, I know this. Uh, it's a preprint actually, which means it hasn't been reviewed probably yet. Yes. Uh, my colleagues who know about this stuff, uh, genomics people, are kind of sceptical. 
and uh, they're not convinced at all. So maybe it'll turn out to be true and maybe not. It comes from a very good person, Betty Corber, who I've known for a long time. But uh, we'll just see how that plays out. At the moment, there's no real suggestion there's any change in virulence or lethality. And in fact, with a virus like this, you might expect if it does change and it becomes more transmissible, it's probably less likely to be, likely to be less virulent, but we don't know. It's, it, that's just speculation. Uh, but at the moment, that uh, no, people in general are not convinced by this. Well, it was released straight online, so it was not peer review, reviewed, uh, reviewed. No, it's a preprint. Yeah, uh, and it was a, lot, a lot of this information is being released as preprints. People want to get our stuff out there quickly so other people can see it. Mm. Uh, but we, we shouldn't treat it as uh, as quite quite as valid as something that's been through a proper peer review process where where other scientists have looked at it and said, hey, we can see a problem here or there's a hole here or maybe you haven't interpreted this quite right. That that's that's the way science works. But but this yeah. is a crisis. We're in an emergency situation. So people want to see whatever's out there as soon as possible because yeah. it may influence the way they're thinking. But I was also noted that there were no experiments in the paper to, to sort of substantiate the claim that it would be more infectious. It's, it's an observational paper, not an experimental paper. And, and uh, you know, we don't have that great experimental systems, really. The, the, um, the various laboratory animal type models are not that... Uh, that in, that's susceptible, in fact, and um, and even the monkeys are not as susceptible as they were to, to the original SARS virus, the COVID one. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so uh, so you know the only way you can really look at the virulence or of this virus in the end analysis is in what happens with people. And if you started to see a variant coming through in people that were severely sick, we would pick that up. And we're yes. doing a lot of sequencing here. And so anything in anyone who's really ill will certainly be sequenced. Uh, mm. The viral genome is only 30,000 base pairs, so you can sequence a hell of a lot of these very quickly. And, uh, and we, we would know uh, uh, pretty fast. And I haven't seen any of that coming through from, uh, from any of the countries. And uh, I, I think it would become pretty apparent if that was happening. Well, does it raise the issue, though, if it, if it does become uh, confirmed that, that uh, the virus is going through, well, you could explain the terms antigenic shift and ant antigenic drift. No, no, it's not. There's no evidence so far that it's gone through any changes. What we're talking about with antigenic shift and antigenic drift yes. is changes in the virus. This comes from the influenza world. Right. And well, this virus is totally different from influenza. Firstly, influenza is a smaller virus. It lacks any proofreading mechanism that this virus has. Influenza throws off vastly more mutants than this one does. Yes. And it also goes through what we call antigenic shift, where yeah. it recombines with another, reassociates with another flu virus to develop a new strain. None of those elements are in this at all. It's not part of the uh, setup. This is a big RNA virus, 30,000 base pairs, as against, say, 13,000 for flu or nine or 10,000 for HIV. So we're not worried about that in a big way, but, yeah. but we'll, t we'll pick it up if it happens. So at the moment, there's no suggestion that it's changing in the site recognized by antibodies, which are part of the, part of the, the recovery process and would be the basis of a vaccine. There's no suggestion so far that there's any significant change in the antibody binding site. Well, you've talked about monoclonal antibodies as being the the future for, for these for pandemics, these sorts of things? They, the monoclonal antibodies, which are a single specificity, mm -hmm. normally when you get an antibody response, you're, you're stimulating a whole lot of what we call different clones with slight, slightly different receptors, which mm -hmm. will become the antibodies uh, that will be secreted. So in, um, in, in a monoclonal antibody, what you've done is taken one of those cells, one of those clonal precursors, and made an antibody from that. Or you can do this other ways now. You don't necessarily have to have the cells. You can do it by various other mechanisms. But that's a, a, an antibody of a single specificity. So it's a very specific reagent. And what you would want to do, for instance, if you were going to treat people with monoclonals, which is a possibility for early treatment, you would firstly have to know they're safe and all the rest, but you'd probably want to use two or three of them so that you didn't select for a mutant or a variant. And so, uh, and I think that would also, of course, be a way of mapping whether any changes in the, uh, in the antigen site that would be equivalent to antigenic drift in a flu virus. 
has that been the issue with past vaccines for things like SARS and MERS? Uh, just no, no. The, the the issue with SARS and MERS was the the issue with both viruses that has worried us is that in both, with some experimental vaccine candidates, but not all by any means, the actual vaccine uh, in in monkeys made the disease worse. Now, of course, we don't want that to happen with this one. So that's why the safety aspect is taken very seriously. Now, so far, in the experiments with monkeys that I know about, which are very limited, uh, there's no safety signal so far. But we have to see whether that happens in humans. So that's why this, we have to go fairly slowly with it. Uh, the, the reason the SARS vaccine didn't go forward was that SARS burnt out. I mean, it, and we got it as far as monkeys. Now, there's, then there was no SARS around, it just went. And so that wasn't progressed further. In retrospect, it's a pity we didn't take it further because it would have helped uh, have the basics for this thing. With MERS, I think um, the reason it hasn't been taken forward to a human vaccine is the case numbers are too low. Uh, I think uh, 2019, about 200 people died of MERS. It's still around. But you, you don't normally vaccinate against something where the incidence of severe disease is that low. Yeah. Well, that's the difference with SARS-CoV-2. I mean, I think the fatality yeah. rates were much higher for SARS and MERS. I think it was something like 9.6 yeah. and 35% respectively. Um, but uh, obviously the fatality rate is lower for SARS-CoV-2, but its, it's uh, infectiousness rate is much higher. So it's spread is obviously... Yes, right. I mean, they all, they all share the feature that they're highly lethal in older people. Mm. The, all three viruses, they're, they're related, but they're not, they're not uh, derivatives of each other, if you like. So they're related bat viruses. We, we're pretty sure of that. Um, so they're all highly lethal in older people. But we, we don't yet really know the exact incidence of severe disease in, uh, in uh, COVID-19. We, we do know that it's... Um, we do know the figures for people who get sick. Mm. I mean, you can see that online and, and that's up around four or five percent. So that's, mm. that's not great. But we, we still don't have a really good understanding of background infection rates. There's confusing information out there, both from the PCR test that we use as the gold standard test and from antibody tests. A lot of the antibody tests that are used for screening as distinct from looking, say, at an infected individual where you're drawing blood and drawing serum. A lot of those antibody tests haven't been working quite as well as we'd hoped, and uh, they're still evolving. We think we're getting there and we'll have good screening tests, but they're not there quite yet. So a lot of the antibody survey results you may read about, we're not sure whether we believe them. Hmm. Well, I guess the, the issue, it seems to me, with antigenic uh, shift or drift is that... Uh, it's the potential for, and for mutation as well, it's the potential for reinfection. So you develop a... Yeah, we've gotten... The... I think the, uh, the sort of discussion of reinfection, there's been a basic confusion uh, with uh, virus persistence. And what we're detecting a lot of the time is that the, 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 the test is extremely sensitive. It's 99% specific and extremely sensitive, the, the standard PCR test, which is the test everybody talks about in Australia as the test. So, but it's detecting viral genome, not infectious virus. And the general pattern is that unless someone gets very sick, and this would be older people, particularly with defective immune systems, the virus is pretty much gone by, by about 10 days after infection. But you can pick up PCR product for much longer. Also, there's, there's no, nobody's detected, I think, infectious virus in stool samples and uh, basically just PCR product. And so uh, it, it says that virus is sticking around at low numbers, but it's not really in, going to infect anybody. The only thing that's a bit, in a bit of doubt about reinfection is we're not terribly sure about what happens with these asymptomatic people who will test positive. We're not sure how good an immune response they're making, and it's possible they may get some reinfection, but we don't know that, and there's no good evidence for it. Well, it seems another issue is that it depends on the length of time. I don't know enough about this, but it depends on the length of time that you are granted immunity for. So, I mean, you may get the infection and then get the immunity for months, but then uh, what about reinfection a year later? Um, 
We don't know about a year later, obviously, because it's only been around a few months. And with coronaviruses um, and with some other respiratory viruses in humans, uh, there, is a, there is a bit of a pattern. Um, this is mainly in kids. There's a bit of a pattern, not with influenza, but, but with other, other respiratory viruses, that you can, uh, kids particularly, can get a uh, croup-like virus, what we call a paraflu, mm -hmm. and in, um, in one year, and then get it again the next year, but the, and then the next year after that. But each time will be less severe. That could happen with this thing. We don't know. We just don't know enough about immunity to coronavirus in humans. The reason we've never taken a lot of interest in them is because they don't cause severe disease. So never, nobody's ever much bothered about them. And so uh, ha, uh, the work's been done on the viruses, but, but really not a lot on immunity. In fact, pretty much nothing, I think. Right. I know that there was a criticism from Professor Edward Holmes, who, uh, who worked on the genetic code of the virus uh, that causes COVID-19, uh, saying that we've had 20 years uh, we've been through SARS, we've been through MERS. Uh, and so I wondered whether our lack of vaccine was not just that it's really difficult to develop a vaccine for these types of viruses, upper respiratory, but that governments have neglected it and that this, the funding generally in science is, is fairly poor uh, from it, ARC it, it, and it, it, HMRC. Both with the with the vaccine and say the antibiotic space is a problem and that is that um, it's left a lot to commercial companies and they're not going to develop something unless there's a profit motive there they can't that's their business they're in business and they've got to earn money so it kind of falls between government responsibility and and um, and industry responsibility there's that's an issue that's why the Gates Foundation, for instance, is bought into a lot of this. Now, with the vaccines, there, wasn't, there is an organisation called CEPI, CEPI Centre Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, uh, partly funded by Gates, partly by governments, to prepare vaccine platforms. You couldn't pre prepare the exact vaccine because you didn't know what was going to come down the pike, but you could prepare a platform, a basic strategy, that you could then slot into, say, ge genetic material from CoV-2. Now, that's what was done. They funded the work that has led to Paul Young's University of Queensland vaccine, the so-called protein clamp vaccine, which is the Australian vaccine that's gone through, um, through testing uh, in the Netherlands, I think, in ferrets, and will go into, hu in, into monkeys, I think, about June, sometime mm -hmm. like that. I think that's the timeline. And that will, that's being pushed forward by CEPI. We're not pushing it from Australia, it's being pushed by CEPI. And so uh, that, that was a good initiative. What would have been great, and I did make a bit of noise about it, but not enough, was to have a comparable program looking at antiviral drugs. Mm. Because antiviral drugs often work across a whole range of viruses. It's possible that if we made a good antiviral drug for SARS, the original one, it might work with this one, would certainly work better, very likely, than anything else that's out there. So we do know that the anti-influenza drugs work right across the influenza viruses. There's a whole range of them, but, um, but we don't have them for this virus. And so I, I wish we'd gone ahead with drug development. And I hope after this, we'll go ahead with a much broader spectrum of drug development against every virus that's a potential threat. Now, that will take public and philanthropy funding. We can't expect the drug companies to do it. It's not going to earn money for them. But it, it should be done and it can be done. But do you think it has been underfunded up to this point, though, or neglected? Um, sort of, uh, but, but it's not been all that... To, yeah, it has been neglected in a sense, if you want to put it that way. But, but I think uh, nobody was expecting this. So, uh, and, we, and Eddie's probably right. We should have been expecting it after SARS and MERS but uh, none of us were geared to it. And so uh, we've been complacent. And of course, we're human beings and that's what human beings do. You know, they react to a threat and then they relax and, uh, and it all slips again. Now, we're very good at reacting to acute threats as we've seen by the response of our government to, uh, to COVID-19. It's been a very good and very encouraging response. And, and, you know, we're very bad to reacting to long-term threats like uh, climate change, uh, which is, you know, much more serious than this in the end. Yes. 
Uh, I, I suppose I, th- I thought that, you know, if you look at the success rate of NHMRC grants and ARC grants, just generally, they're, you know, they've decreased over the years. So it, it probably yeah, makes so. it very hard for a small lab working on something like uh, a bat coronavirus to survive. Well, basically, you know, not a lot of research is done by small labs anymore. I mean, a small lab is eight or ten people. They're not that small. So the research itself has become much more expensive. It's true that the ARC and NHMRC funding hasn't really kept pace. Um, the last great advocate we really had for, uh, for medical science in Australia was John Howard, uh, who was helped by Brendan Nelson. Right. Uh, and on both sides of politics, we haven't had quite that level of advocacy. Tony Abbott uh, introduced the Medical Research Futures Fund, which has proved to be very useful in some of this. Uh, but it would be great if we had more funding in, in, across the science spectrum in general in Australia, I think. Mm. But, you know, we have to convince government of that and, uh, and money's going to be tight. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be problematic uh, in the longer term. So I hope they decide that after this experience, keeping science strong is a priority, but, you know, politics is a different area. So, uh, so we'll see what happens. Well, there's a lot of factors to this. I know that Edward had, throughout his career, as far as I can tell, called for, uh, re, you know, investigation and closure of these uh, wet markets, like the one in Wuhan, where, where the virus is supposed to have originated from. Um, I suppose the other thing I would... I know at the moment the Australian government and the US government are calling for an investigation uh, into well, how, how China handled the outbreak of the virus. But I know that from a scientific perspective that you need to find out who the intermediary hosts were between the bat um, and human. Um, and so I wonder whether that happened at this sort of government uh, investigation or whether that involved collaboration between scientists. Well, uh, the right way to... We need to find that out in the long term. That would be useful. But that... That would normally com- come out from the kind of scientific collaboration and, and, uh, and uh, basically exchange that we have through science. And, and bringing this up as an issue at this time has been a particularly stupid thing to do. It uh, it's, was started by Trump, who's trying to distract attention away from his own appalling performance in this. And, uh, and I have no idea why we bought into it. We shot ourselves in the foot. It's done us damage. We gain nothing by it. I mean, if you really want to get something out of China, you don't walk up to them and poke a stick in their eye. In fact, that doesn't work really well with most, most situations when you think about it. I think uh, this, this was not smart and it's cost us. And I think we should back away from it as soon as possible. We need to collaborate with China. They've been pretty good actually at collaborating. And, uh, and quite frankly, uh, um, they let out the virus sequence early. We got, uh, we got the, what we needed from them in January. And uh, I think on the whole, uh, as far as I know, they've been pretty open. Mm. Uh, I suppose uh, I, was, um, I was thinking back to your work in relation to the um, Spanish influenza. Uh, it's interesting to note the differences between that pandemic outbreak and, and this one. Um, but that it was sort of a founder and a, and a kind of a mother to all of the later uh, pandemic outbreaks, particularly, uh, you said it was antigenically similar to the 2009 H1N1 swine flu. Um, and I wondered whether, not that I want to create anxiety about it, but whether COVID will sit as some sort of new founder for future smaller, perhaps, pandemic outbreaks? I, I, I doubt it very much. I mean, I think COVID, um, you know, the basic, the problem with influenza is uh, you've got this segmented genome, you get reassortment, and it goes backwards and forwards very easily between pigs and people, for instance, uh, very easily from chickens to people. We've had a number of these, these cases, the H5N1 bird flu, H7N9. A lot of people have died, but they haven't, uh, it hasn't changed to transmit them. So it's some of the 1917, 1918, 19 virus um, went across into pigs. Maybe it was in pigs first and then came to us, we don't know. But some of those genes that were in the 1918 virus, which were reconstructed a few years back by PCR, uh, we didn't know what the virus was until that was done, but it was a bit of uh, molecular archaeology, if you like. Mm-hmm. And uh, so some of those genes have uh, been sitting in pigs for decades. 
and uh, they came out again in the 2009 swine flu. And the nuclear protein, for instance, is almost identical to the 1918 um, H1N1 flu. Uh, but this, uh, the uh, 2009 wasn't a particularly severe pandemic. In fact, uh, people thought it shouldn't have even been called a pandemic. It was only called a pandemic because of the, the rules of WHO at that time. And, uh, and there's other things that have changed since 2000, uh, since 1918. We, uh, we can make flu vaccines. Might take us six months, but we can make them. Uh, we have flu antivirals, which if you use them early, are good. But the other major thing is that a lot of people in the 1918 uh, experience died from secondary bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. So that can be treated with antibiotics. So it, it's, uh, I don't, I've never expected, it's always been pop possible. But I haven't thought we'd have anything quite as bad as 1918. Now this, of course, is a virgin soil pandemic. We've never seen the virus before. And we really, at this stage, don't quite know how bad it is. We know people are dying, a lot of old people are dying. It's very distressing to watch. But, but in terms of human numbers and uh, what the eventual toll will be, we don't know. The, the question of background infection will understand if the virus starts to turn down, if the epidemic suddenly starts to turn down in Northern Italy or New York, as they relax restrictions, we'll know there's a lot of herd immunity out there. That can be the only explanation. There's a lot of other people who've been infected we don't know about, and they're partly at least immune. So we'll have to see. Well, we, it's still early days. I mean, we've only been dealing with this, with this for several months. And look how dramatic it has been so far. Yeah. Well. Uh... The other thing that I was interested in is that it's, a, you know, the coronavirus is a subfamily, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, but the beta uh, subfamily is the most infectious and the most severe in terms of fatality rate. Do we know why that is, why beta um, bat coronaviruses are, are so uh, I think infectious it, and fatal? It's not, that it's not that they're beta coronaviruses. We've got a, a beta coronavirus, which is one of the common cold viruses in humans. Mm. It binds to the same receptor as SARS-CoV-2, and we don't worry about it particularly. So it's not the fact they're beta coronaviruses. The, the, it's, it's a problem that comes straight out of bats, maybe mm. via an interior intermediate, because they're adapted to bats, and they're adapted to living in bats in a way that's very different from living in us. The bat has an immune system that works rather differently from ours, it seems. It relies a lot more on what we call innate immunity, uh, which means it doesn't necessarily eliminate viruses, but it doesn't get severe damage caused by viruses. Part of this, a lot of the severe damage caused by viruses is by our immune response trying to get rid of them or getting rid of them. And so uh, the bat does this differently. And so it, the problem is that, that, that it's been a bat virus, not that it's a beta corona. Once it's established in humans, I, I would expect, I would not be surprised if it does get established in humans, uh, it may be around for a while. I'd, I'd expect in time, it'll be much more like a, um, uh, just a, a virus that's there, we don't worry about too much. And I think part of the reason for that will be that many people will have either been vaccinated or infected, and even if, the, even if that immunity is not lifelong, there'll be partial immunity. and. Uh, you then won't get severe infections. But we'll just have to see. That's a prediction, it's a guess. The other thing that I, that I was interested in is um, it's, it seems unlikely that we'll uh, get a really, really effective vaccine first off. I mean, they, they vary in efficacy as far as I understand. And, it, you know, the first, first ones may be only 60, 70 percent. Um, the, then how does it work? I mean, is it uh, a combination of people contracting the virus generally in the community to some extent in a controlled way with a balance of older people taking the vaccine? Yeah, the likely, likely con what I think is likely with the vaccine, I think if the vaccines are giving some measure of protection in humans, which will have to be true before, uh, before they're put out there in large, large quantities. I mean, nobody's going to, put out a vaccine which is pretty ineffective. 60% immunity wouldn't be bad though, uh, because what you, because you know, the, the, the problem with the vaccine is gonna be getting a good response in old people. Old people don't respond well to vaccines. They don't respond well to the flu vaccine 
and the Australian government, for instance, pays for a high test vaccine, which has got a lot of protein in it uh, for older people. So it could well be that the vaccines won't be very good in old people. But I would think if you gave them, say, to the um, five to 55 year olds or five to 60 year olds, um, they, if, uh, if they were, say, 80% effective in that group, that would greatly increase our herd immunity. There's another possibility too, and that is some vaccines are very easy to produce in large quantity, and these are what we call the RNA vaccines. And if they work at all, it might be a good idea if we had a, a protein vaccine or a virus vector vaccine which were working moderately well. Might be a good idea to use them as boosters or as initial priming. There's, there's a few strategies out there we could try because you could produce a lot of that stuff very quickly. What we should be doing at the moment is laying in a hell of a big supply of syringes and so forth so we can actually give the vaccine because we're at the end of supply lines and a lot of things. So um, I, I think we'll get a vaccination strategy that works. I, I think we'll have it working uh, pretty well by, um, by certainly a lot of people we've been vaccinated by mid-2021. I'll be very surprised if that's not true. Did, did we ever develop a, a vaccine that was effective for SARS and MERS? Because uh, I had read that they, uh, when no, they were there monkeys, we, they we actually... That, I think there was no point. I mean, we didn't go ahead with it because there was no point. The, the vaccines actually uh, created a, an inflammation response on the upper some, respiratory Some system. did, others didn't. Some yeah. did, others didn't. We haven't seen that yet with any uh, COVID-2 vaccine that's gone into monkeys, but there's only a limited number so far. Yeah. I mean, basically what you've got to do is put it into monkeys, challenge them with virus, and see whether you get an inflammatory uh, outcome that's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, that hasn't been so, so far as far as I know. I haven't heard anything about it. We did see it with some of the SARS and MERS vaccines, but, um, but by no means with all of them. Some, some of them seem to work fine. We could have gone ahead with them, but there was no real point because SARS was gone and MERS just wasn't high enough incidence. Uh, I was wondering how you felt the media or even segments of the media had handled uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, whether you felt it was done responsibly. Oh, there's been confusion out there and there have been confusing voices and, uh, and, and you know, in our modern, uh, our modern uh, uh, um, online world, there are networks of crazies. I mean, you know, people worrying about 5G towers and, and Bill Gates implanting chips in people. I mean, there's all sorts of nuttiness out there. I think on the whole, um, uh, the media have been okay. I mean, we had... Uh, an absolutely ridiculous thing in the uh, in the in the what the Sydney what is it the uh, one of the Sydney Telegraph or one of those things where where you know journalists some some journal there's there are not a lot of scientifically literate journalists out there. Uh, yes. they've tended to, a lot of the science journalists have gone because the companies can't afford them, and I don't uh, and there just aren't many of them. The good journalists, they call you up and they ask you and they talk to you and they ask for explanations and, and they've been fine. And on the whole, I've, t I've talked to people uh, from Sky News, The Australian, um, Sydney Morning Herald and so forth. Uh, all the people I've talked to have written reasonable articles and been fine to deal with. I've had no problem with them. Uh, mm. There's been a, a, a kind of arguments from economists uh, some of the right-wing economists that we shouldn't do the, the lockdown, yes. that it's not merited. And early on, there was a lot of stuff saying, well, this is no worse than flu. Well, it, it, is, it is a lot worse than any, any flu we normally see. It's a horrible disease. And it can, we think it may leave a lot of long-term sequelae in people who don't die from it. Well, uh, we don't know that yet. Well, uh, that, kids, uh, yeah. I think that's an important point. I don't know, uh, you know, how you, uh, what you've got to say on that, but I think that we tend to get caught up in fatality rates, cr critical fatality rates. So we, you know, with the uh, seasonal flu, we tend to look at about 0.1%. Um, with this, uh, you know, once you take into account all asymptomatic people with the sample sizes, we've got like things like cruise ships, it's looking at about 1.4%, which is uh, very high. But what people don't talk about is, young people who contract it become very ill and then we don't really know 
the lifelong effect in terms of morbidity and mortality that has effect in terms of lung function and things like that from having pneumonia? Yes, I, we don't know that. And, and we won't know that for a long time, of course. I mean, you know, I had whooping cough as a kid, for instance, very badly. I think it probably res affected my respiratory function for the rest of my life. And uh, it always appalls me when, when some of the anti-vaxxers won't vaccinate their kids against whooping cough, which is a highly lethal disease. But, you know, all these elements are out there and uh, they're all rattling around and they've got uh, celebrities who know nothing about science but think they speak with authority on anything in there. And there's all sorts of craziness. We've got billionaires buying useless drugs and, yeah. you know, the, the whole insanity is out there of... Uh, of, of um, of weirdness, but but I wouldn't point a particular finger at uh, the at the conventional media. I think on the whole they've been pretty good. There's there's a few a few things that have been pretty silly, but but they get pretty they've been uh, uh, quite soundly dealt with by uh, people like Media Watch or or the way they've been handled on Twitter feeds or whatever. Well, the, I've noted for a while that there is a pressure uh, or a uh sort of a synthesis that occurs between the media and between scientific institutions. And this, this study was pointed out to me by uh, a friend who's a scientist who, um, who's currently working on coronavirus. Um, but it was, um, it was with the Monash University and the Doherty in, uh, Institute. Um, the paper was that the, um, and the t paper's entitled The FDA Approved Drug Invermectin Inhibits the Replication of SARS-CoV-2 in Vitro by Carly et al. Um, and what they claimed in the paper was that viral replication was shut down somewhere between 24 and 48 hours by about 5,000 times or greater than 5,000 times. Um, and he was talking about the fact that the title was e even in of itself was misleading um, in that it's FDA approved for nanomolar concentrations. And what was used in the paper was at micromolars. Um, and so essentially at that dose of, it's sort of super physiological, probably shut about shut everything down. Yeah, I mean the the ivermectin story is very preliminary, to say the least. Yes. It, um, it, it's a great drug. I mean, it was developed for heartworm in dogs, mm. and it works well there. And um, and then it was, uh, it, was um, it was given uh, by the company Merck uh, free to treat river blindness in humans, where it's a great drug. And the guy who uh, did that, uh, Campbell, won the Nobel Prize. And so uh, it was a wonderful, a wonderful thing. But I think as far as uh, drug against SARS, we, we're going to have much better possibilities coming down the pike very quickly. Uh, we're testing, we're screening a lot of drugs at the moment. Uh, that's part of our role. And we're just talking about how to expand that screening. And uh, it... Um, it, there's some candidates that look as though they might have a bit of promise. The next thing is to get them into lab animals and get them tested and see whether they have any effect uh, outside tissue culture. But the ivermectin things aren't even tested in tissue culture. I think we're much, much smarter if we go for, for specific drugs against this virus, the, the designer drugs. I mean, you know, HIV, the drugs are all designer drugs. They're designed to fit the molecules of HIV by what we call structural biologists. So, who do that using synchrotron and so forth. Um, uh, Mark, Mark von Itstein at uh, Griffith University is one of these guys. And uh, that's where we should be going and as fast as possible. I do think we should be pushing drug development as fast as vaccine development, really going for it. Because with older people who um, may not, a vaccine may not work, what may work is preventive drugs. That you could give them a couple of drugs every day as a pill. And we do that with HIV, we call it HIV prep. They'd have to be uh, active antiviral drugs that work well, and uh, you could do that as preventive and keep them safe. So, um, and also people who have defective immune systems or can't respond to a vaccine for whatever reason. So, so I think we need to push drug development fast, but I'm very skeptical about, about a lot of these repurposed drugs. At the moment, they're what's being tested, but you know, because we can, yeah. not, not because they're the optimal. Well, I suppose that they're, uh, if they're already FDA approved, then mm. you already have some degree of safety, I suppose. Uh, yes, a lot of the safety testing is being done. I don't know about ivermectin. I don't know what level of safety testing is being done in humans. But I'd, I'd, I'd be very surprised if ivermectin is the answer to this. Mm.
Oh yes, from you know we've we've had cases where uh, there's been talk, like in terms of uh, America, you're talking about some of the irresponsibility from President Donald Trump and and people uh, dying because they've you know, I guess the last thing you'd want is people buying head lice uh, lotion and drinking it or something like that. <laughs> I shouldn't lie. There's a bunch of people out there who've got a religion where they. I think they drink dilute bleach or something. I don't know. Um, you know, religion is, well, you know, the religion industry is an interesting one. Mm. Uh, I suppose when you're talking about vaccines and you're talking about the, I guess, the structure of the virus itself, we, we, we talk about glycoproteins and the spike protein. Um, how does all that work in terms of, in layman's terms, uh, entry into cells and replication? Well, basically, the virus binds to the cell. It binds to a molecule on the cell called ACE2. Mm. And this particular virus binds very tightly to that. And it binds what, through what's called the RBD, the receptor binding domain on the, H, on, the, on the spike protein of the virus. You know, you can see it on the pictures of the virus. So uh, the, the vaccines are kind of directed against that spike protein, all the ones I know about that look to be well ahead, uh, develop, uh, directed either against protein or some sort of genetic delivery system that would make protein, either by just giving the genes themselves or by putting them in a virus vector like AD5 or something of that sort. So that's basically the strategy. But there are also other strategies out there that would use uh, uh, what was called a VLP, a virus-like particle, this is the strategy that's uh, used in Ian Fraser's uh, human papillomavirus vaccine. Uh, we've got one of those vaccines under development at our institute. There are also several others around the country, I think. And they will be um, uh, the possibilities to test as backup products. We'll certainly take them through um, small animals to test and we'll see how they go. Uh, we don't know. And, uh, but they would have, they could have depending on how the virus-like particle was made, they could have a much broader spectrum of, uh, uh, of the virus proteins in them. Yes, because the, the virus um, affects lung, alveolar, uh, epithelial cells. Um, and you talked about ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, but the, I was interested in this because uh, that the... the uh, I guess the concentration or the genetic differences between people in terms of their expression of ACE2 in their lungs is to some extent a predictor of whether they're susceptible and fatality rate. That would be logical. And, and one of the things that was said early on is to give up smoking because it'll upregulate ACE2. I'm not right. sure what the status of that is now. I need to check back on that one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, ACE2 is, uh, we would think if you've got high levels of ACE2, uh, that you would be more susceptible to an infection. But, you know, sometimes paradoxical things happen in these infections. But the, uh, the aim of the vaccine is to block that binding event, block the binding of that receptor to ACE2. Uh, there's a, uh, um, one of the receptors for HIV is known, and, uh, uh, or several of them are known, but if you block one of the main ones uh, due to the genetic absence of that or a mutation in it, they don't get HIV. So, you know, the receptor is a target. So, uh, so that's the main strategy, and I, I think that should work, quite frankly, but we'll see. Well, I wondered because I read that the ratio of males to females in one paper that I read, uh, I can send you the references if you like, uh, is uh, 3.25 to 1, um, and, and males tend to have higher um, levels of ACE2. Um, also, yeah. uh, Southeast Asians as well who are more susceptible. And I wonder whether there should be sort of public health warnings to specific um, populations based on their genetic profile yes we know that men are much more susceptible than women but we all, we've known for a long time actually that women particularly as they get older make stronger immune responses than men do and one of the problems is for women is that they get a lot more autoimmune disease than men do because mm -hmm. of that so uh so it is an issue and and it's certainly the case that if uh, if you're female you're much more likely to come out of this alive if you have to go to hospital but you know that's the fact of the matter and uh there are various speculations about why that is, and uh, uh, including a more powerful immune response in women. Yeah, because sometimes, I guess the, there are two parts of it in terms of infecting people greater with immunodeficiency, but also if you have a, 
uh, some some of what causes the damage is uh, sort of a misdirected immune response and an overactive re immune response from uh, when you contract the virus. Yes, what we what we think might be happening here is that. In people who don't have particularly good immunity, and that what we call specific immunity, that is older people uh, particularly, what we think is the specific immune response is not clearing the virus. The virus persists. And as a result, what we call the innate immune response, which produces a lot of toxic molecules, normally switches on early and can help to hold a pathogen in check until the specific immune response switches on. And we've seen this also with a very severe flu, that we think that the the innate immune response is trying to compensate for the lack of the adaptive immune response that's producing all this toxic stuff. And it's that that's contributing to people dying. And uh, there's been trials done of a uh, treatment, which is an approved human treatment, which is a monoclonal antibody to the cytokine interleukin-6 uh, that have suggested, but rather anecdotal evidence so far, that treating with monoclonal antibodies to interleukin-6 can bring people who are very severely ill uh, back out of that stage. Now, there's, there, are, there are proper clinical trials going on at the moment. So we should get the answer to that within a, a few months, I think. Uh, there's also other molecules in that category we could think of. Uh, one is interleukin-1, the other one is, is anti-GM-CSF, uh, 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 which was developed at the Hall Institute in, in Australia. They're all in, going into trials of various sorts, I think. I know the anti-GM-CSF is in trial. I'm not sure about... Um, and the interleukin one. But these are all drugs which are approved for human use for something else. Mm. So once something's approved for use for something else, you can quickly uh, ask for a compassionate use and uh, use it in, in say, uh, very sick people with COVID-19. So there's no barrier to using these things. We just need to know that they work. Yes. Well, I know it informed uh, what we understood about Spanish influenza informed the H1N1 swine flu where vaccines were they would have been directed towards older people, but they actually realised, I remember reading your work about this, that they realised that older people had been exposed to at least some variant of Spanish influenza and therefore they were protected. And so the vaccine for H1N1 went to younger people and probably saved lives. Um, well, there was no vaccine back in 1918-19. We didn't even isolate the virus until 1933. No. In 2009... Nine, um, yes, that's what I was talking about. In 2009, when it came back, the, yes. the reason it looked relatively mild is because a lot of people who were, people who were alive in 1977 had probably been infected with a similar virus and still were immune, which shows you how long immunity to flu can last for right. a specific virus. So, uh, yes, we didn't see a lot of deaths in the older group, which is why death rates were down. We did see some of what we saw in 1918. We saw fit young adults uh, dying or in uh, ICU units, uh, particularly fit, uh, heavily pregnant women. And some of them died. About half of them were sa saved by, by heart-lung machines. Mm. Uh, and of course, that's a very limited resource. We don't have many of those. Uh, the best we can hope with COVID-19 is to get onto ventilation at the most. Mm. But um, it's, it's certainly the case that, uh, that it was much less severe in 2009, probably because older people were partly immune or had uh, relics of immunity. And with SARS-CoV-2, I mean, we, we look at uh, the children seem to be mostly asymptomatic and that they're much less likely to pass on uh, the virus to, uh, to adults. Uh, but there are reports now from the UK and the US of something that looks like a Kawasaki-like uh, syndrome and immune, uh, immune inflammatory response. Is that something we should be concerned about? Uh, Kawasaki is, a, is an autoimmune disease of kids, which we haven't known the cause. We've long suspected a virus trigger. And there's a hint from New York particularly that the incidence may be up by about twofold, I think. Um, maybe a bit more, I don't know and that, uh, that the coronavirus is triggering it. It could be that there are a number of different viruses trigger Kawasaki and coronavirus can do that. Well, we really don't know. I don't, I don't think it's an enormous concern. I mean, some kids, it's a, very, it's a pretty low incidence, but, uh, but some, some young kids have died from the coronavirus, but relatively few. And uh, we're not looking at them as being a major transmitter as the way they are flu. 
you know, what, what often brings flu into a household is children uh, from school. Now, we don't have any evidence of that from, from SARS-CoV-2. And even where schools have opened up, uh, in Denmark, I think it was, the, uh, the uh, R0 went up from about 0.6 to 0.8 or something. So it's still less than one, which is fine. Uh, the only thing I wonder about with schools, we talk about schools as though they're homogeneous entities, but mm. you know, we're talking about kids who are six years old and kids who are 17 years old. Yeah. And they're very different, both physiologically and in the way they behave. So, so I'm, I'm, I think sometimes we get a bit confused here, but, but we'll see what happens with the schools. I mean, that will be, um, we've had, we, we saw a, uh, a school had to be shut down in New Zealand, for instance, because of high incidence of infection. The other thing is, of course, um, a major worry with school, a major concern with all this, of course, is that the school kids themselves may not get severely infected, particularly the older ones, is how much they transmit it into the household. But we'll only know when, uh, when, we, when we go ahead with this and we see what happens, and we do a lot of testing, and that will clarify the issue. We have the capacity to do that now. Because we're still not clear around why children are seem to be much, much less affected or asymptomatic in most cases? No, I mean, we don't have enough information. And we don't, in general, have enough information about asymptomatics. We need a lot more information on asymptomatic infections. So there are, there are trials set up here, particularly with healthcare workers, where they're being screened very, very regularly. So if they're being screened and they're given permission for multiple samples and everything, the usual conform consent. So if we start to see some asymptomatics in the healthcare workers, we should be able to work that through and really find out what's happening. That's what needs to be done, is to actually follow some asymptomatics through. We do know that symptomatic people, people who d definitely get a clinical infection, are making good antibody responses. I think that's very clear. There's a very recent paper. Again, it's a preprint, but it comes from a great lab, and the data is very clear that they're making good antibody responses, which would be protective. So I'm in no doubt that people who are clinically affected and get over this are going to have decent antibodies. Because that can be used then for what they call passive immunity, which they can, in the first stage, be provided to healthcare workers. So taking the serum uh, from people who've been affected and creating uh, a vaccine from that, essentially. Not a vaccine, but you know what it's I mean. It's not a vaccine. It's a preventive or a prophylactic. Mm. It's a therapy. Yeah, so that work's already underway here. CSL will do the work. They have the, they're the biggest blood products company in the world. They're setting up to, um, to take convalescent serum and uh, clean it up and provide it back. Uh, I think we may be involved in testing some of it to see whether it's got good antibody levels. We need to test them to see they've got good antibodies. So, so you know, that, that, that product may be available. We don't have an enormous number of convalescents yet in Australia. If it ramps up, we will have a lot more. Uh, other countries are producing this sort of product, but uh, in the face of the pandemics they're suffering, I don't think they're going to let it out. Uh, that's a bit of a problem for us. We're at the end of supply lines, and I think we need to do a bit of rethinking about this after that's over. A lot of, you know, the, the human immune system until recently uh, hasn't been all that well studied. Now we're starting to study it very carefully and very thoroughly, but but uh, only, only really quite recently, it's because we've got much better tools. And Catherine Kaczewska at our institute, for instance, is doing fantastic work. But uh, there, there's a lot we don't know about the immune system, uh, both in adults, but particularly in children and in the elderly. Mm. And we need a hell of a lot more research. It's, uh, it's well worth doing. Mm. And we'd been start, we've been doing it, but uh, it's a way to go. Well, I imagine... Um viruses and pandemics and, and the immune system in terms of funding uh, labs that are uh, working in that area should be assured funding uh, for a very very long time now we we actually have been um uh, we've been very well funded uh, we've got a lot of money from we've been well funded by the australian government and uh on for influenza in fact i just came off my very last grant at the age of 79 uh, last year. Uh, but, um, but Catherine, who's uh, very much out there in the, uh, in the human immunology space, has money from uh, uh, US National Institutes of Health and various other sources. She's extremely well-funded mm. and, uh, and is a major international uh, player in this. 
Uh, so the money's out there if you're doing the stuff that people want to hear, want to know about. Mm. And there's a lot of stuff that's really important we need to know a lot more about. And a lot of questions are going to be raised by this, this uh, COVID-19. So, mm. And we'll find out a lot. We'll, we'll understand human immunity better after this. Uh, uh, but um, there's a, a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope it goes well. Deep Trouble is produced by Steve Charman in the studios of Maine FM, Castle, Maine. The Deep Trouble podcast is presented by Trouble Magazine at troublemag.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>